Good morning. Good morning. Hold on. Good morning. There it is. All right. Hope that everybody's doing well. As we begin worship, I'm going to call Elizabeth Wigington up to um, do a special blessing over um, our Operation Christmas Child boxes. And you can see over here, we had a packing party last night. 519 boxes were packed last night. And then we have, yes, and then we have others. And if you have brought yours, if, if you will go ahead and make your way down and put it on this side, so we can make sure and sort them properly as we get ready to take them to the distribution center tomorrow. So if you have yours and you have your boxes and you want to bring them over here, Elizabeth's going to come and uh, pray a, a blessing over these because this is more than a gift. It's more than a, uh, a box of toys and toothbrushes and, and different things. What it is, it's an opportunity to tell a child about Jesus. And that's the most important gift that we can give is the opportunity for someone to hear the message of the gospel. And so Elizabeth, come and we'll see that. I just let all the boxes come first. This is great. We got more, yay. Awesome. Let's pray together this morning. Um, Lord, we just come to you and we are so thankful. God, we're so thankful that we have so much. God, we look around and every day we have food to eat, we have clothes to wear, we have a place to live. We have jobs to go to. We have a beautiful church building. God, we have so much. And God, we thank you for the opportunity to help others. And, and Lord, we just come this morning all having had a different role in these boxes. Um, Lord, there are people that have packed boxes as families, those that just brought boxes up, and do this as a tradition, and we thank you for those. And there are CCDC families and friends and coworkers that have packed boxes and put up here in the front. And then, Lord, we've got this group of 519 boxes up here that have been packed by a group of people. And God, we just thank you for the project. We thank you for Amy and we thank you for Tracy as they headed up this project for the church. And God, so many people were involved in this. And, and I just thank you for them. And God, I just pray that you would bless each person who was involved and gave something of themselves. And God, it may have been money in an envelope in Sunday school. It could have been folding bags and sorting flip-flops on Wednesday nights. They could have brought items that were put in the boxes. Maybe the contribution was coming and folding boxes or attaching labels. Maybe it was giving it to the love offering last Sunday for postage. Maybe the people were a part of the group that came last night and had a party and had fun packing them all. God, there were so many details that went into the packing of the boxes and the managing of the money that was given. And God, we just thank you for blessing Amy and Tracy with organizational gifts. And God, we just ask you now that you bless these boxes because God, we were blessed by packing them. And I thank you for that. Lord, we pray for the probably 600 plus children that are gonna get a box handed to them. And Lord, we look in these boxes and they're trinkets. They're things that, that we take for granted. Our kids have many of or don't want. And God, we just ask that these boxes go to children who will truly see them as an extension of your love. God, we've heard stories of these boxes for years, how they get to exactly the right child. And God, our 519 boxes have flip-flops. We ask that they go to kids who need protection for their feet in warm weather. Lord, you know what's in the boxes on the left. Maybe they have gloves, maybe they have hats. Lord, you know the kids that need those things. And we just ask that through your miraculous ways that you bless the right child with the right stuffed animal, the right child with the right toy. And God, we pray more than anything that this simple gift will be an extension of your love 
and through the Bible and the literature in it and the follow-up um, opportunities that these children and their families come to know you and that it can be the beginning of a relationship with you that not only gives them peace and comfort on this earth, but God eternal life with you. Lord, I pray for the logistics of these boxes. There are thousands and thousands of these boxes that come in and thousands of boxes that can be used to bless children. But God, there's so much red tape with governments and customs and shipping and borders. We ask that that not be a problem, that these boxes get to places that missionaries can't go, that your word gets to places that it often is cut off. And God, we just thank you for the opportunity to be a part of something that sounds small, but God can be used in a big, big way. We ask that you bless our efforts and take these boxes as our gift. In Jesus' name, amen. We worship a God who sent his son to die for us. I pray he reigns in your hearts this morning. You have kindled a burning desire in our hearts to know.
Amen. You may be seated for just a couple of moments. Uh, good morning. Welcome to Council Baptist Church. My name is Jeremy Litton. I'm the director of Children's Ministries here. Uh, we're so thankful that you're here with us this morning. There are lots of things still going on within our church. So if you have a bulletin, uh, open, up the, up, open that up and you can see all the stuff that we've got going on. Next week we have our Thanksgiving dinner, so make sure uh, to be looking at that as well. Um, again, we're just so thankful that you're here. If you're a guest with us this morning, there's a little tear-out sheet there in your bulletin. So if you want to fill that out, we would love to get to know you a little bit more. And you can just put that in the offering plate later on in the service. I'm going to pray, but as I pray, I'm going to ask Emma Rivas uh, to come up, and she's going to talk to us a little bit um, about room at the end. So let's pray together. Lord, Dad, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. And we have to worship you and to join together as a church family to come and to praise your name. And thank you um, for this, this huge, just um, this outcry that we have, Father, for these Operation Christmas Child boxes. And thank you for the willingness of so many um, to participate in giving that gift to those um, who are to receive it, Father. Um, I pray for this time. Um, to, as a church that we have together, and I pray that you'll just be with, bless this service and uh, be with us. And thank you for your many gifts. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. morning. Why you still got your bulletins open that Jeremy was talking to you? If you'll pull them back and look at the section on room at the end. Uh, on the first page at the bottom where you see the little house frame and the Christmas lights strung across the top. This is our, our logo. Um, Carrie Gaddis did such a great job of designing that for us. But first of all, we just want to thank all of you. Just You've been so generous already with your donations. Uh, the baskets continue to be filled downstairs uh, in the foyer, and we'll leave those baskets there up until the 30th. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to, you're still, they'll still be there for you. But we appreciate what you've done so far already. We also want you to be a part of it. And there's three ways that we really, we, we need everyone here. And we need your prayers first of all. We need you to pray uh, that the families that we're working with will be able to see Jesus, that they'll be able to see that this church loves and cares for them. Uh, we also uh, need volunteers. And everyone has been so willing that we've, that we've been soliciting, but we don't want to solicit help. We want, every, we want you to come forward and volunteer. We have spots for everybody. We need people uh, to work in the rooms as they go from room to room, and, and I want to explain that to us a little bit more. We need people to help us set up, people to help us clean up. We need uh, just volunteers in each of the, the rooms, people to help the, the families uh, carry their gifts back to their car because it's going to be a basket full of things. Uh, we need just uh, people to uh, greet them and make them greeters at the door to make them feel welcome. So there's a spot for everyone here. If you can't be here on Saturday, if you can come in on Friday the day before and help us set up, that would be great too. Uh, we need you in all sorts of ways. Now, as you've heard before, we're we working with 18 families. That's about 50 children that we're going to be working. And we want to invest in these families. Uh, you, hopefully you're going to see a lot of them at Thanksgiving. And if you do, make a point to, to make them feel welcome too and for them to know that we're glad they're here and that we, we care about them and then hopefully they'll be able to come back several more times and feel a part of our, of our church. Each family has been assigned to uh, a pair of our church members and they've given them a, a personal invitation. They're all scheduled. They'll be coming in at uh, like 15 minute intervals. They all won't be here at the same time. And this host team will be taking them from room to room as they make decisions. They, they uh, will go in a gift room where toys have been uh, purchased for them to choose from that would be age appropriate for their children. There'll be another gift wrapping room. So we need people in each of these rooms that will help them wrap all these gifts. While they're doing all this, their children are upstairs uh, making a craft for their parents or they're playing uh, board games. We need, people, we need people in those rooms as well. We also will have the staples room. That's what the basket's downstairs. We've been collecting the household items for. 
uh, we need people to help them distribute that. Each of them will have one of those baskets to take home and a basket full of those staple items that you see collected. It just gets interesting. Susan Walters has been the one that's been coordinating the staples part of it. And every time she empties the baskets, they fill back up. It's just, it's, it's really been a blessing to be a part of all of this. It really has in many ways. We also have a prayer room a very important prayer room, and that's one of the rooms that our families will be visiting uh, during this process. And we have people, we need people. We have some people already agreeing to, to be in that prayer room as support, but it would help to have some that could rotate and take some shifts in there. So if, if that's something that you feel like that's where your ministry needs to be, then please let one of our group know. Now, Kim Stein is, is the leader of our team, also Susan Walters, Cindy Perkins, Virginia Graves, Peggy Richardson. Uh, any of us will be willing to help you, help you, uh, we'll get you scheduled and get you appointed to a certain area of this that we can use someone. After the, the parents have gone through all of the four rooms on this floor, then we'll be taking them downstairs to the fellowship hall and letting them enjoy a Christmas brunch. And while they're having the Christmas brunch, there'll be a, a short devotion and some Christmas carols. And it's just, an, it's just, we want it to be a really special event. And we're hoping that this is the beginning of an anniversary event that we'll be doing every year. Now we're doing this instead of White Christmas. And many of you remember when we did White Christmas years ago. And you know, when Jesus was born, there was no room at the end for him. But because of Jesus and Jesus' love, there's room at the end for everyone. And we want, we want them to feel that way. So any way that you want to be a part of this, if you want, you know, we, we need your prayers, we need your volunteer work, and, and your monetary donations, just designate it, room at the end, you know, however you're used to giving, you can designate on your check, on your envelope, the online, whatever you're used to doing. But look forward to seeing everyone December 1st for room at the end. Special music was a new song for us called God is Able. And we introduced that to you and we wanted to uh, bring that back and give you the opportunity this week to learn this song. So thankful that I serve a God that is able to do the things that our mighty God could do. I sure wouldn't want to serve any other God other than the one who sent his son Jesus to die for my sin and to give me salvation.
Jesus, hey, come on, right? When the cross was enough, the cross was enough. Amen. As our ushers come forward, bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, the cross was enough. And Lord, you did take all of our shame. Lord, we should have been in your place. But Lord, you decided before the beginning of time, Lord, you decided that you were going to be placed on that cross. Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you for being that, 
substitute for us that or just the one that is willing to lay down their life or for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, thank you. Lord, I pray that you just take this offering, Lord. You multiply it and you bless it. In your name we pray. Amen. Kids XP, you can come on forward. We sing together, blessed be the name. Uh, good personality, good people skills, and multi, you have to be a good multitasker as well. I think people's personality. If you do not have a good personality, then you're not going to make it in this field. People depend on somebody that's happy. They don't want somebody that's constantly around them that's going to be down and depressing and all that. So. Uh, patience. You need a lot of patience. Patience. Patience and um, some good people skills works a lot. You, know, you just got to be easygoing, get along with everybody and uh, learn how to deal with the difficult ones when you need to. Um, I get to serve a lot of great people. Um, sure, you get to meet a lot of not so nice people, but I've been blessed a lot through this job. Um, people have just, even when you're coming with a, maybe a bad attitude or uh, not feeling so well, people will just have a great way, or even God has a great way of just kind of lighting up your spirits yeah. and lifting up your spirits, so it's been good. Personality for one. Um, multitasking, for sure. Multitasking, I think, is probably the number one thing, actually. You could get somebody that is really shy, and then still, if they can multitask, you know, things are getting done, and people are getting what they need, so. I would probably say a good attitude, because if you come in and you're bringing in, like, negativity with you, that's obviously going to affect your service, so even if you're struggling personally, it's good to just kind of, like, think about that, but don't let it like really come through and make sure that you understand that other people are going to come in with their own baggage and maybe they're having a bad day. So when you serve them, I think that you should probably keep in mind that you don't know what they're going through 
before your own personal stuff gets in the way. So I think you should keep the person you're serving in mind. Number one. Don't you love it when you get a good waiter? They come and they introduce themselves and they ask what your drink order is and they, uh, in a timely way, they bring that order back to you. They take your food order, they smile at you, Karen, and act like they're actually glad you're there. Your food comes and it's hot. They're paying attention the whole time and making sure that if that glass starts to get empty, they're going to fill it back up. When it comes time for dessert, they always ask, do you want dessert? I, I hate it if they miss that part of it. That's an important part. And then they bring the bill, and a good waiter at the end of the meal, when they bring the bill, it just, they say, don't worry about it. Henry Lee took care of your bill. It's okay. You, know. you ever gotten a bad waiter? I think all of us have had a bad waiter or a waitress. You know, how about when your food arrives and they engage you in a long conversation uh, about their life outside the restaurant or their job, or when you ask them about different things on the menu, every response is, that is amazing. What about, what about that one? Oh, that's amazing. What about that? Is that very good? That's amazing. It's really not too helpful at that point. Everything's amazing. Or it takes 20 minutes for your waiter to get your water back to you, your chips and salsa. Uh, they let your food get cold before they actually ever bring it out to the table. And Elizabeth especially likes those waiters who just disappear. Have you ever had one of those? You know, they take your order and then you, you never see them again. You have to go literally go back to the kitchen and hunt for the person to, uh, to find your, your food or your waiter. Well, the truth is it's not easy to be a good waiter. It's not easy in a restaurant and it's not easy in life. But every one of us is a waiter, aren't we? We're all waiting. We spend a lot of time waiting. We have whole rooms and buildings devoted to nothing but waiting. We wait. We wait in line. We wait on election results. We wait on the mail carrier. We wait on some of us would agree with Brad Paisley, we are waiting on a woman. Uh, we wait for the release of a new movie. We wait for the Kentucky Duke basketball game. We wait to forget about the Kentucky Duke basketball game. Some of us can't wait for Christmas. Others of us can't wait for Christmas to be over. Some of us have waited for folks to come back from being uh, overseas, and they've been deployed overseas. And we would be remiss this morning if we didn't say thank God this morning for our veterans. This is Veterans Day weekend, and uh, it was November uh, 11th at 11 o'clock in the morning in 1918 when the armistice was signed with Germany, and we began to celebrate Armistice Day from, from that point on in 1918. In 1954, uh, we changed the name to Veterans Day, and we have recognized our, our military veterans uh, not just ones, as we do on Memorial Day, that have, have died. We recognize the ones who are, are still here as well as those who have passed on. So if you're a veteran this morning and you can stand, would you stand this morning, a current veteran, or you've served in our military forces? God bless you. We're grateful for you, and we're grateful for your service. Many of us have waited. Some of you waited to get out. You knew your date, and when you're going to be discharged, that was important for you. We're constantly, we're waiting, aren't we? Parents who are waiting for a baby to be delivered, and a high school kid who can't wait to get to college, and then the college students who are just waiting for graduation and that first job. Everybody's waiting for the next thing. We're all waiters. And sometimes waiting is easier than other times. We pray for an answer and it doesn't come, and we wait. We think we're ready for a mate, but nobody's stepping up. We're praying to get pregnant, but that's not happening, and we wait. We put in a job application or we apply for some type of a school and we wait on the results of that application to come back. We're waiting on a pastor. 
We're all waiting on something. How long does that sick, older, lonely adult in the nursing home who's lost their spouse and who all their friends have gone to be with the Lord, how long do they have to wait? Because they're ready to go home, and they wait. Lewis Meads writes, waiting is our destiny as creatures who cannot by themselves bring about what they hope for. We wait in the darkness for a flame we cannot light. We wait in fear for a happy ending we cannot write. We wait for a not yet that feels like a not ever. Waiting is the hardest work of hope. And earth seems to be full of waiters. And since it's so full of waiters, I wonder in some ways it would be appropriate to consider earth God's waiting room. We're here waiting for the transition to another world. But something's supposed to happen in this waiting room that's more important than reading a 2013 Sports Illustrated or a 1999 Reader's Digest. Here God is wanting to see what we will do with all our waiting. While we're waiting for our table at a great, great banquet in a magnificent mansion in another realm, God is waiting to see what kind of waiters we are. The Bible's full of the stories of men and women who have passed through this waiting room before us. Noah was told to build a boat in a place where he'd never seen rain, and he would wait over 100 years before the rain would come. Then he had to wait for the floods to recede, all the, the while contending with a floating zoo, and he lived there every night. Job systematically lost everything that mattered to him. He lost his children and his material wealth and his health and his friends, and he waited for perhaps years before God would deliver him. Abraham was called of God to father a great nation, but he was 75 years old, 75 years old before he ever was told to go, and then he didn't even know exactly where he was going to go, and he would wait 25 more years before Sarah would get pregnant with Isaac. Joseph sold into slavery by his own brothers, and he has to wait time and again as he endures false accusations, as he's sent to prison, as he's mistreated. Moses finds himself on the backside of the desert of Midian for 40 years as he waits, watching his people being beaten down over and over and over again. And when godly, God finally intervenes to deliver with Pharaoh, Moses has to wait as a reluctant Pharaoh holds off again and again on letting the people go, even after plague after plague. Simeon and Anna wait the birth of the Messiah. Jesus waits on God's will. Mary and Martha wait for Jesus to come and to save their sick brother Lazarus. They wait, and even after he dies, they wait four days. Judas waits for Jesus to overthrow Rome. And the disciples wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And Paul waits for God to take away a thorn in the flesh. They are all waiters and so are we. We are God's waiters. What kind of waiter are you? This morning, I want to encourage you to consider some biblical truths about waiting. First, I think the Scripture suggests that God's waiters realize that who we are becoming as we wait, is oftentimes more important than what we are waiting on. When the children of Israel spent 40 years wandering in the desert, it was less punishment intended to uh, make them miserable. It was more a discipline intended to shape their character. Listen to the words of Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 through 6. Remember that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness so that he might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you by letting you go hungry. Then he gave you manna to eat, which you and your fathers had not known, so that you might learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out. Your feet did not swell these 40 years. Keep in mind that the Lord your God has been disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son, So keep the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. Waiting. There are all kinds of waiters out there. There are all kinds of waiters in here. We've got grumpy waiters. We've got happy waiters. We've got some impatient waiters. 
We have anxious waiters. There are bitter waiters and resentful waiters. And when God uses the spiritual discipline of waiting, it's quite different than when he uses spiritual disciplines like prayer or fasting or reading the word or silence or solitude. All those are things which apply to a particular time and place. And Jen, if we are really disciplined, maybe we read our Bible an hour a day or maybe we pray uh, for an hour a day or maybe we fast once a week. Maybe we engage in solitude and silence on a, on a quarterly basis. But the interesting thing about this discipline of waiting is that God uses 86,400 seconds a day to teach us in our waiting. Every moment, he gives us a chance as we wait to become a more dependent, more humble, more loving human being. Think about a grumpy waiter who was waiting in the checkout line in the grocery store. She was in a hurry, and she, she really just wanted to get out of there. And she had her, bought her broom, some cleaning supplies, and she was waiting there in the line. And, you know, as she waited, she, her body language just said, I'm ticked off. I don't want to be here. I shouldn't be waiting in this line. And she would occasionally utter a big sigh. She let everybody know that you know, she, she shouldn't be waiting in this line. And when the cashier called for a price check... Uh, she had just about enough, and she said pretty loudly, well, I'll be lucky to get out of here by Christmas. Be lucky to get out of here and get home by Christmas. And the uh, clerk said to her, well, don't worry, ma'am. With the wind kicking up out there and that brand new broom you just bought, you're going to be home in no time. <laughs> God doesn't want a grumpy waiter any more than we do when we go to a restaurant. He's not pleased with grumbling waiters. God wants to remind us that who we're becoming as we wait is oftentimes more important than what we're waiting for. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait for the Lord, be courageous and let your heart be strong. Wait for the Lord. 43 times the people in the Old, the Old Testament tells the folks reading, wait on the Lord. What might the Lord be doing with you in the waiting room of your life at this point? What are you waiting on? What kind of waiter are you? Maybe you feel like the prophet Habakkuk when he cried out in Habakkuk 1-2, how long, Lord, must I cry for help? And Habakkuk pours out his frustrated heart to God. How long, O Lord, must I cry out to you for help? And then in chapter 2, verse 1, he ends up writing after the Lord's responded to him, but before the Lord says, write the vision, before he gives him a clear vision, here's what Habakkuk says. He said, I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower. I will watch to see what he will say for me. One of the things I learned as I was studying for this message this morning is that uh, there was a time when the word waiter was cognate or synonymous with the word watchman. A waiter was known as a watchman. And that's exactly what Habakkuk is communicating here. He says, while I'm waiting, I'm going to also be watching. Now, I like that when I'm in a restaurant. I like to know that my waiter is keeping watch. I like to know that they're checking to make sure that glass is not half empty. I like to know that they're watching to see when we get close to the end of the meal, if they want to come and, and bring the bill. I like when a waiter is, is watching. We've looked at some truth in the Scripture already that suggests that who we are becoming as we wait may oftentimes be more important than what we're waiting on. But the second truth I want you to notice this morning is that God's waiters are active and expectant watchmen, not passive passengers on a sad and anxious journey. God's waiters are active and expectant watchmen, not passengers on a sad and anxious journey. Habakkuk said, I'm going to stand at my guard post and I'm going to station myself at the lookout tower. I'm going to see what God's going to say to me. I will wait, but I will wait actively. Psalm 136 says, I wait for the Lord more than the watchman waits for the morning. More than the watchman waits waits for the morning. When we wait, we're not wasting time. 
were not supposed to be doing nothing. When he waited, Noah was building an ark. While he waited in prison, Joseph was helping other people with their dreams. While he waited on God to deal with the thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, Paul was spreading the word throughout the world. As you watch, you're to be expecting, I'm to be expecting that God is doing something. He's growing us. He's teaching us. He's doing some things quietly that we won't notice unless we're watching for them. The Chinese bamboo tree is one of the most remarkable plants on earth. Once the gardener plants the seed, it takes, uh, it, all, all you see is a single shoot come up out of the bulb, and it takes five years before that plant ever gets uh, uh, out of that uh, bulb. And, and the whole time, the, uh, the thing only grows about an inch. It comes out of the bulb, and it grows about an inch in the first five years. But at the end of five years, the Chinese bamboo will perform uh, an amazing feat. It will grow a remarkable 90 feet in 90 days. You might ask yourself this, when did the tree actually grow? Did it grow at all in the first five years? Did it only grow in those last 90 days? But the answer lies in the unseen part of the tree the underground root system. During the first five years, the fibrous root structure spreads throughout the ground, and it takes up nutrient, and it becomes wide, and it becomes deep in the earth, getting ready to support that vertical growth that surely will come. It's been said that if God wants to grow mushrooms, He can do it overnight. But if you want to grow an oak, it will take some years. If you want to be an oak, you'll have to wait. Being active in your waiting means that you stay alert to what is going on, to what God might be doing, and you pay more attention to what you are doing than to what you're not experiencing as you wait. I'm reminded of Simeon in Luke 2, 25. You remember Simeon. The Scripture tells us that he was a righteous and devout man who spent his life waiting for the Messiah, waiting for what the Scripture says was the consolation of Israel. He'd been told by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until God's Messiah came. We think of Simeon as an old man who'd been waiting all his life, but the Scripture never tells us that. He may have been young, he may have been old, but what we know is this, he had spent his life, however long it was, waiting for the Messiah. He was an obedient watchman who waited expectantly, who went daily to the temple. And he waited and he watched. And then one day, some young parents come into the temple with a little baby. They bring their son to the temple where Simeon has gone every day, and there's a spark of recognition in Simeon as the Holy Spirit says to him, this is the one you've been waiting for. And Simeon takes him in his arms, and he praises God, and he he says what now is one of the most beautiful, uh, I think, refrains in all of Scripture. He says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised Now let your servant depart in peace. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Simeon waited, but he watched as he waited. If you're waiting on something this morning, let me encourage you that you're supposed to be active in your waiting. If your finances are messed up, Rather than waiting for a surprise check in the mail, maybe you're supposed to take a job that might not be your first choice. Maybe you're supposed to go to a Dave Ramsey seminar to to begin to take some steps to figure out how God would guide you in those finances. Maybe you can sell a a car where you have a big car payment and, and, and buy something that would be much cheaper. Maybe it's a small decision that you could make, but waiting on the Lord is not passive. Think about this story I heard recently. I shared it the other night. It was a story of a, um, a man who, uh, you know, every day he would, he would go walk, and uh, he would always keep his head down. This story was uh, highlighted in Ripley's Believe It or Not, and he'd walk and he'd keep his head down. He walked with his head down all the time, not because he was shy, not because he was worried about stumbling, not because he was worried about losing his balance, but he walked with his head down because he was looking for coins. 
And over the period of 25 years, he found over $8,100 in lost coins. $8,100, that's not bad. And I thought, what a great lesson, that sometimes it's the small things that we do that can make the most difference. We overlook these things. And maybe you're waiting this morning on something and you're, it's hard. But what are the small things that you can do as you wait and as you watch? God wants to remind us that who we're becoming as we wait is oftentimes more important than what we're waiting on. He wants to remind us to be active and expectant watchmen as we wait, not passive passengers. The third thing I think he wants to remind us of is that God's waiters are clear that we are not the chefs. As we wait, the truth is we have all kinds of ideas about how things should work. I know what I'd like on my timeline, some of the things I've been waiting on. I really know, and I could, I could, I could tell you. I know what I would like to have happen, but at the end of the day, I need to remember that I'm not the chef. I'm a waiter. I don't dictate what comes out of the kitchen or what comes out of heaven or what comes out of the hand of God. I'm here for one reason, and that is to serve. As you are waiting, how are you serving? How are you serving? My experience has been that the most bitter, grumpy, unhappy waiters in this life are the ones who are not serving. I'll never forget the first extended break I took as I moved from being a, a full-time counselor to a full-time professor, and I was looking forward to this break, and I thought it's going to be great. I'm going to do everything I want to do. I'm not going to do anything except my favorite things, and that was great for about a week. And then Elizabeth would tell you, I made her absolutely miserable for the rest of the break. And she said, please never do that again. I was irritable, I was hard to please, and I was demanding. And she would say that's the way he normally is, but he was even more so at that point. Part of what I realized is I'm not meant to take extended breaks where I do nothing to help anybody. We're not created to just please ourselves. Serving helps me keep in mind that at the end of the day, it's not about me. As a server, I'm reminded that my opinions and philosophies and political views and preferences should always be subservient to the one that I represent. God doesn't need opinionated, argumentative waiters. He doesn't want waiters who post every opinion on social media. He doesn't need us to be so black and white that we vilify everyone in our country who has a different perspective. No, he wants servants who make a difference in people's lives as we wait. How are you serving? Let me encourage you this morning, if you've been struggling with some anger or you've been struggling with frustration or you've been struggling with sadness or anxiety, let me ask you, how are you serving? And maybe part of God's answer is to help you find a new way to serve. And I know Brad and Will and Jeremy and others here would, at our church would love to talk to you about all kinds of different ways to serve through this church. The Scripture tells us in 1 Kings 13 that King Saul was commanded by God to wait on the prophet Samuel. Samuel was to come and arrive to make the necessary sacrifices before a, a huge battle with the Philistines. And Saul waited for a time, but Samuel never came. And so Saul took it upon himself to offer the sacrifices. And because of this, the Scripture tells us that God took his hand off of Saul's kingship. Saul's unwillingness to wait on God resulted in disobedience and him doing his own will instead of God's will. It's important to remember that being active and not passive waiters doesn't mean that we're to try and force things to happen. Maybe you heard about the teacher who was helping one of her kindergarten students put his boot, boots on, and you know, he was pushing and she was pulling and finally got th those boots on after all the effort, and she had worked up this sweat. About the time she got them on, she almost whimpered when he said, teacher, they're on the wrong foot. Well, she looked, and sure enough, they were on the wrong foot. So, you know, they, she pulled, and he pushed, and they finally got those boots off of the wrong foot and pushed them back on the right foots and feet. <laughs> Sound like rusty. <laughs> wrong foots. And um, got them back on the right feet. And about the time they got them on the right feet, he said, Teacher, these aren't my boots. 
And that's what she did, Kathy. She just shook her head and she bit her tongue. And, you know, how do I, so, you know, she pulls them off again. Well, you know, she wanted to say, why didn't you say so in the first place that these weren't your boots? So she finally, they get the ill-fitting fit, boots off. And then the little boy says, teacher, these are my brother's boots. My mama made me wear them. So they struggle with it one more time. They get the boots back on his feet, and she didn't know if she was going to laugh or cry. And so they get him on the feet. She's ready to send him out the door. It was a cold day. She said, well, where, let me ask you this, where are your mittens? He said, well, I stuffed them in the toes of the boots. <laughs> you ever have one of those days? This is not going right. Of course you do. Everyone in the, this room has those days. Henry Nowen once wrote about uh, some friends of his who were trapeze artists. He was interviewing them and asking them, you know, what's it like, the special relationship that there is between the catcher and the flyer? And they said, well, it is a special relationship. The flyer is the one who, who, who just lets go. And the flyer lets go, and the catcher is the one who catches. And when the flyer is swinging high uh, out above the crowd on the trapeze, the moment comes when he has to let go. And as he lets go, he arcs out into the air, and his job is to remain as still as possible while he waits for the strong hands of the catcher to pluck him out of the air. The trapeze artist told Nowen, the flyer must never try to catch the catcher. The flyer must wait in absolute trust. The catcher will catch him, but he must wait and some of us here this morning are in some pretty vulnerable spots. You're waiting on some things, and that waiting is not easy. You can feel like you're falling without a net. Let me encourage you to keep looking to the catcher. Let me encourage you to keep trusting the chef. Don't stop serving as you're waiting. Remember that God wants to grow you, so keep watching and keep expecting. And keep remembering the promises of Isaiah 40, 31, when it says, but they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not feel faint. Keep waiting. Keep serving. He's coming. Would you pray with me? Father, we are all the persons who wait in a place ultimately for the opportunity to go home or to meet Christ when he comes back to take us home. While we're here, Lord, we know that this thing of waiting is not something that happens occasionally in our lives. We are constantly living in a state of waiting. Lord, this morning I pray for each person in this room that this message wouldn't just be another Sunday morning message that may, maybe doesn't always get applied. I pray, pray there'd be a specific application in each person's life regardless of what it is we are awaiting. And I pray that some this morning, perhaps even in the sound of my voice, would have been awaiting a Messiah just as Simeon was. Perhaps there's a person here that's never given their life to Jesus Christ. They've waited all their life for this moment. Your word tells us that you love us, but that we're separated from you by sin, but that you sent your only son Jesus to come and to be a once-for-all sacrifice that we don't need to offer other sacrifices, but if we'll accept your son, we can know eternal life and we can know the hope of, of heaven we can know the hope of abundant life on this earth. Lord, if there's one this morning that needs to make that decision, I pray that they would, they would do that and they do it publicly. Father, we thank you for the ways that you can apply your word to our heart, and we trust your spirit this morning to do just that. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing this morning? If there's a decision that, that you need to make uh, publicly, I want to invite you to do that and to, to come. Perhaps you need to come to the altar and pray. Maybe you're looking for a church, and we would welcome you at this church. A lot of great things happening here at Campbellsville Baptist Church. So as God leads, uh, would you be obedient to him this morning?